Good morning and welcome to our chapter four review. Again, we go over the frappy. You have some options at the end for what you wanna do for your assignment. Read your content first. Make sure you do everything um, according to the question itself. So like mentally set it up, work through them. If you wanna do the con practices, make sure you're documenting them because that can be your assignment as well. And of course, you know, piggies, they're awesome. Uh, 15 minute timer, instructions on the frappy. Remember, you're going to pause the video and read through every slide before you actually see the solution. So here is A, B, next slide, C, next slide, D. All right, you've had an opportunity to read them. Of course, you can always pull up the PDF for yourself in the assignment tab. And let's look at those solutions to our frappy. So. In a recent study, 166 adults from the St. Louis area were recruited and randomly assigned to receive one of two treatments for sinus infection. Half of their subjects received an antibiotic, amoxicillin, and the other half received a placebo. If you don't remember the term placebo, you might want to research it. Make sure you know the statistical definition and not just um, the like uh, layman's term for it. So. Describe how the researchers could have assigned treatments to subjects if they wanted to use a completely randomized design. Phrasing we haven't seen in a while, but I want to make sure that we uh, reset about this question. It's kind of simplistic, so maybe you can kind of walk yourself through it yourself. So describe how the researchers could have assigned treatments to subjects if they wanted to uh, use a completely randomized design. Means you have to remember the parts of a completely randomized design. But let's go ahead and look at our answer. So we went ahead and labeled 83 note cards with the letter A and 83 note cards with the letter B. Why did I pick 80? Three and 83. Well, if I take 166 and divide by two, look at that, I have 83 and 83. So we've already separated our two sets of adults into two different groups. That's what we've done. We shuffle those cards and hand one card out to each subject at random. So by giving each uh, subject a card at random, have we, in essence, randomized what their treatment would be? So we're not assigning a treatment group based off of anything except randomization. Subjects with A get the antibiotic, subjects with B receive the placebo. There's a lot of different ways you could have randomized this. You could have told me you used a random number generator, you could have used popsicle sticks, you could have used the table D with the random numbers, and blah, blah, blah. There's a hundred different ways you could have set this up, but as long as you recognize that A, that they don't know which treatment they're getting, and there's no, and we don't know who's getting the treatment or why, blah, blah, blah. So just make sure it's fully randomized, reset and relook at that part of the chapter if you need more definition. Moving on. Here's your practice. Um, this session's cons practices are a little bit more broad. They really just focus on study design and experimental design. Um, I couldn't really find questions that zoomed in just on those basic concepts. I would go to the review practices for those. In recent studies, oh, sorry, same concept. So here's the same information looking at question B. All the subjects in the experiment had moderate, severe, or very severe symptoms from the very beginning of the study. Describe one benefit and one drawback for using subjects with moderate, moderate, severe, or very, or just using subjects with very severe. So we wanna know what's the benefit and drawback for using all three symptoms versus just looking at 160 to 60, 166 adults with severe sinus infection symptoms. So what is a drawback and what is a benefit? Your answers might be a little bit different, but I want you to see our two answers. Benefit. We can make inferences about subjects with moderate, severe, or very severe symptoms. We just cannot make inferences about those with only very severe symptoms. So basically, we can make an inference about people with sinus infection symptoms from moderate to very severe. That's all we can do with that benefit. That's pretty cool though, right? Because if we know about this medicine and how it affects sinus infections, that's still a benefit. We don't need to know always that, it, that how much it helps the person who has severe symptoms. Now that would be a secondary experiment, wouldn't it? To hey, to find out what's the next step. So if I prescribe 10 milligrams of amoxicillin versus 15, well, I don't even know what the standard uh, dosage of amoxicillin is, but you know that could be a secondary or share or multiple designs inside. And that's how we progress to understanding, you know, what are dosages? How much do we give a person? What's the best treatment? Blah blah blah. What's a drawback though of using the different types? of um, symptom levels, and that would be variability. Because we're looking at all sorts of different types of symptom levels, you've got a lot of variability in their test scores. And so that means um, you, you're gonna have all sorts of different test score answers 
So the people with moderate are going to have certain answers. People with severe, very, very severe are going to have certain answers. And those will probably link and group together, hopefully, but the variability will definitely occur. This will make it more difficult to find convincing evidence that the antibiotic is more effective than a placebo. So to really find out if that antibiotic was more effective, you might actually have to start breaking them up into that moderate, severe, or very severe. So that would be a big drawback. Finding errors is a really good practice on con under study design. All right, moving on to question C. At different stages during the next month, all the subjects took the sinonasal outcome test. After 10 days, the difference in average test scores was not statistically significant. In this context, explain what it means for the difference to be not statistically significant. So the first thing you have to do is figure out what does statistically significant mean? Like, what's the definition of statistically significant? And then you got to put it in context. So let's go ahead and see that context answer. Because the difference in average test scores was not statistically significant significant, then the difference wasn't large enough to rule out random chance as a plausible explanation. Uh, that means the observed difference could be due to the random assignment and not the effects of the treatment. So that's what, the, that's what statistically significant means, is means whether or not it's due to chance. And so if it's not statistically significant, then that means we can't rule out chance. So... And let's move on. Okay, so need more practice. Experimental design considerations, again, is a more broader uh, practice than kind of narrowing in on statistically significant. If you're looking for just statistically significant practice, um, maybe email me or something and we can go back and forth about that. All right, so final question. One possible way that researchers would have or could have improved the study is to use randomized block design. So again, you might have to have gone back and checked either an image or the textbook or something. What the heck is randomized block design? You could have Googled it for yourself. Explain how the researchers could have incorporated blocking in their design. If you are Googling this, I recommend that you look at the images because people have posted some really good breakdowns of what randomized block design can look like as a visual representation. But let's go ahead and jump in, figuring out how our 166 adults receiving one of two treatments for sinus infection could have been a randomized block experiment. So one form, we could have formed blocks based off of the initial conditions so that um, moderate, severe, and very severe symptoms are our three blocks. Within each block, we now are going to give one half of that block uh, the amoxicillin and the other half the placebo without them ever knowing and hopefully without the experimenters also knowing, so it's a double blind, uh, but we're not, gonna, not jumping into that just yet. Blocking by initial severity will help us account for the additional variability in test scores caused by differences in severity. Some kids might have said, why not block by, by treatment? Well, remember, blocking has to do with um, kind of a categorization of the population itself, not the treatments, because, you know, that's why they're called treatments. They're, they're an entirely different step in your experimental design. So blocking has to do with, you know, am I blocking them by gender, by GPA, by um, favorite color, whatever it is, you're blocking them by something that describes the population. And here is that unit exam on study design. I really suggest y'all start working through those cons. Um, they're great practice to kind of reset and refocus on each topic at a time as we begin to work towards those mega FRQs that are going to be the 45-minute online take-home exam. That's all I've got for you so you know the end. If you can skim through the PDF for answers to the odd questions from the chapter review, or you can go directly to your assignment where you can choose one of three options. Of course, you can always do more. The most recommended option is solving one FRQ from the practice test, or you can solve three multiple choice questions. Make sure you show me your work. No work means no credit. Or you can send me screenshots of your cons. Okay? Um, you don't have to be super successful in the cons. You just have to show me you're working through it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.